Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, this bill is about the UK Government taking a pragmatic approach to policy making, which allows legislation to better keep up with the speed of scientific advancement, something which a great deal of existing legislation fails to do. Scottish Government motion, however, is symptomatic of the Scottish Government's continual desire to create difference between Scotland and the UK at any opportunity. Now, we do have some sympathy with the desire to clarify the scope of Clause 42, but the Scottish Government's approach to addressing this, introducing an unnecessary LCM, seems to be more about posturing than principle, and we cannot support the motion as it is drafted. The very first line in the motion has the Scottish Government demanding that the Parliament not support the bill. And there's no way we can get past that because it is a decent bill. It supports research, much of which happens here in Scotland, and ensuring that our food producers are not put on an uneven, uneven playing field when supplying to our biggest market, the rest of the United Kingdom. Are the Scottish Government really suggesting that we throw the Scottish food producers under the bus because of a clause they question? The Scottish Government have stated that they would back off if the bill is amended as it progresses through the UK Parliament. That, presiding officer, is of course the correct route to developing good legislation, not scouring every piece of draft legislation to see if there is a way to create further discourse and division. And that brings me to Clause 42. Clause 42 provides the Secretary of State with the power to make supplementary, incidental or consequential provision by regulations in connection with any provision of or made under the bill. Powers to make the consequential provision are common to most bills. Scottish Government officials proposed amending wording for Clause 42, which would require Scottish ministerial consent for any consequential amendments, which the Scottish Parliament would also be competent to make. The UK Government's position is that Clause 42 does not trigger an LCM and that an amendment to Clause 42 is neither desirable nor necessary. Now, that is because the Convention to seek an LCM only applies when legislation makes provisions specifically for a devolved purpose, not when legislation deals with devolved matters only incidentally to or consequentially upon provisions made in relation to a reserved matter. Reserved includes matters which apply substantively in England only. The UK Government's view is that Clause 42 does not trigger the LCM process, nor does it engage the Sewell Convention. Devolution guidance is clear. Consent need only be obtained for legislative provision, which are specifically for devolved purposes, and the bill is England only. The UK Government has updated the Delegated Powers Memorandum and explanatory notes of the bill to reassure the devolved administrations and illustrate the intended use for and the limits of Clause 42. Of course, I cannot rule out that the Scottish Government approach has been driven in part by the SNP's wider opposition to gene editing. Despite the urging of farmers and researchers alike, the Scottish Government remained firmly on the fence, insisting they will wait to see what the EU does instead of delivering the guidance the sector in Scotland has been calling for. Aside from the fact that this approach is likely to put Scotland's farmers at a competitive disadvantage with the rest of the UK, by far its largest market for agricultural goods, it is almost certain to mean that our life sciences sector misses out on the opportunity to be ahead of the pack in the growing gene editing sector. So the SNP will ignore an opportunity for Scotland to lead the world and take advantage of new technologies, but they can't ignore any opportunity for a constitutional spat. It is progress sacrificed on the altar of process, presiding officer. Setting aside for the moment the somewhat more controversial question of genetically modified organisms, any halfway balanced assessment of gene editing which does not involve the introduction of new genetic material would tell you that its potential benefits for Scotland's agriculture and indeed the wider planet are substantial. The potential to increase crop yields, enhance the nutritional qualities of food and reduce the use of chemicals in agriculture alone should make it an attractive prospect. That is before we consider its potential to help us deal with climate change, both as a means of improving the resilience of staple crops to climatic conditions and reducing CO2 production in farming. Standing officer, had the Scottish Government written this motion in a more pragmatic fashion that looked specifically at questioning or modifying Clause 42 of the Bill, you may have found us more likely to help you seek a resolution to the issue. However, as is the Scottish Government way, 
why work to develop the optimum legislation to protect Scotland's food producers and our life sciences when we can manufacture a full-blown constitutional storm in a teacup to further their own narrow agenda? As I've often said before, they act less and less like a government and more and more like a radical protest group. Presiding officer. Thank you.